Inspiration comes and goes just like the seasons And I'm looking for the smallest reason to keep pushing on See fear and failure go hand in hand like bride and groom on wedding day For heaven's sake, and you better wear your best Oh hell This is for Trayvon, Kendrick, Tamir What happened? No justice This is for Freddie, Michael, and Eric What happened? No justice This is for Ahmad, George, Brianna We speak your name We fight for justice Because God is justice Go and tell if I've wandered so long in the darkness of Rome, praying that I make it through. I have stumbled, I've strayed from the path that you've paved, and Lord, I surrender to you. From the darkness I rise with each tear that I cry, I place my heart in your hand. to Song in Our Hearts, celebrating the rich diversity in Black music. Brought to you by 50 Forward, a nonprofit serving older adults in Nashville, Tennessee. I'm Keith Richardson, All of Us Outreach Coordinator for 50 Forward, which is a national community engagement partner for the All of Us Research Program. All of Us is a new initiative to form by the National Institutes of Health to advance precision medicine. Right now, our healthcare system is one size fits all which does not reflect the rich diversity represented in our country today. The program seeks to change that by recruiting 1 million people from diverse backgrounds to volunteer and share their health information, helping researchers find better treatment and cures for all of us. Nationwide, over 450,000 have joined us so far, with 80% of those coming from communities historically underrepresented in biomedical research. You can learn more and you can even join by visiting our website at joinallofus.org slash 54. Nashville is known as Music City and reflects a diverse range of music talents and tastes from roots, blues, and jazz to country, rock, and hip hop. Today's events aim to showcase this rich musical diversity, which reflected in black music and increase our understanding and appreciation for all music genres it represents. We are delighted that you have joined us for this special event, and we hope you will be inspired to reflect on how the inclusion and appreciation of diversity can only uplift and advance our community as a whole. And now it is my pleasure to introduce moderator, Dr. Paul T. Kwame, musical director of the world-renowned Fish Jubilee Singers and Mike Curb Jubilee Singer Endowed Chair. Dr. Kwame, one of seven children, was born in Ghana, West Africa, his father, a musician, taught him piano, violin, theory, and conducting. He studied music at Ghana's National Academy of Music and taught there until immigrating to the U.S. in 1983 as a student at Fisk University, where he promptly joined the Fisk Jubilee Singers. After graduating Fisk in 1985, he continued to study music at Western Michigan University and graduated with a Master's of Music degree. He also holds a Doctor of Musical Arts degree in conducting from the American Conservatory of Music. In the spring of 1994, Dr. Kwame was solicited to serve as part-time director of the Jubilee Fist Singers. Later, he was promoted to a full-time faculty member in the music department and became the musical director of the ensemble. He is the first African to direct the Fist Jubilee Singers and the first to hold the Curb Beeman Chair position. Dr. Kwame, a composer, arranger, feels a deep connection between Negro spirituals and the music of his motherland. He states the music we sing today helps to bridge the gap between Africans and African-Americans. I am reminded of my life in Ghana 
whenever I hear the Fish Jubilee singers and sing the Negro spirituals. For Dr. Kwame, music touches his spirit. He believes in the fullness of God, who was a source of his faith, wisdom, hope, and love for slaves and for the original Fist Jubilee singers. Welcome, Dr. Kwame. Thank you very much, Keith. It's great to be here and um, very honored that you would invite me to be the moderator for this very special event. Uh, we have some wonderful artists here. Um, they all live in Nashville because Nashville is a place that is drawing some of these artists and they are making changes. So I'd like to introduce them to you one by one. First, we have Byron Harvey. He's a singer, songwriter, recording artist, and National Museum of African-American Music representative. Byron Harvey and team is a gospel slash Christian soul band from Nashville, Tennessee. Byron, along with Memphis native Christian Walker, formed a league of singers and musicians in 2017. Byron is also the supervisor of guest services as the newly built National Museum of African American Music right here in Nashville. And he's also the co-founder of Inversion Vocal Ensemble. Welcome, Byron. Then next we have Julie Williams, a country recording artist, singer songwriter, Julia, Julie Williams is turning heads in Nashville's country music scene with songs that tell the stories she wishes to hear as a child. As a student at Duke University, Julie was signed to Small Town Records, whose alumni include Mike Posner and Delta Ray and sung as a vocalist for the Duke Jazz Ensemble. That is amazing. After graduating with a public policy degree in 2019, she moved to Nashville where she became a regular host of the song Suff Suffocates and performed at the state of Tennessee's 100th anniversary celebrating a uh, celebration of the 19th amendment. She was also named uh, in Rizzi Palmer's Color Me Country Class of 2021 and featured on She Wolf Radio's One's To Watch To Watch list. In April 2021, she was featured on PBS's New Hours special on Black women in country music. Her single, Southern, uh, Southern Curls, released in March 2021 about the struggles of growing up mixed in the South was, convey, was covered by Billboard, CMT, Women of Country, and numerous music publications. Julie, Julie's fans, over 5,000 now, including me, in only one week, to find the song's music video. So welcome, Julie. Looking forward to hearing from you. Then next we have RJ Green, a gospel recording artist from Chicago, Illinois. Reginald Green Jr., known as RJ Green, was born and raised in Chicago, Illinois. He is a creative artist with an eccentric nature. Encountering music at an early age, Green would watch his father practice and would pay close attention to the way he played the keyboard. He became determined, even at a young age, to play like his father. I have a story to tell you, RJ, because you did what I did as a child also. Uh, then we have S-Rap. S-Rap is an um, international hip hop slash spoken word artist from Nashville, Tennessee. SRAP is an international hip hop spoken word artist whose lyrical style and unique cadence set him apart from his peers. His vivid wordplay, dynamic spoken word and conscious subject matter paves the way for his eclectic sound. His art has been compared to 
unique blend of Lupe Fiasco, J. Cole, and Kendrick Lamar. He raps in Japanese, produces his own tracks, and makes appearances in commercials. So panelists, I welcome all of you. Uh, we have some interesting topics to talk about today. And I hope that all of you will share from your heart. So those who are listening will benefit from this panel discussion. Uh, before we begin, I'd like each of you to share just a brief thing about yourself. So the audience again will hear from you. We'll start with you, Byron. All right, awesome. Hi. I. Um... Obviously, I'm Byron Harvey. Um, I've been uh, in Nashville. I'm a Nashville native. Um, also, just been I've, I've been working at the uh, National Museum of African American Music for the last year, um, helping our guests and uh, also uh, meeting really great artists and even honoring um, people like the Fish Jubilee Singers. Um, also, I'm the co-founder of Inversion Vocal Ensemble with Dave Raglan, a mutual friend and. Um, I've done, I've, I've, I'm just happy to be here. I've worked with RJ before and uh, also Keith many times. So it's an honor and a privilege to be here. Great, wonderful. Julie. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Julie. I am from Tampa, Florida. Um, and kind of about my my musical background, I, I grew up singing, um, in church that was I, where I feel like a lot of people get their start and so I grew up singing church and then my church choir and then I started playing uh, at beach bars and weddings a very Florida in a little Florida beach band with my acoustic guitar that was my my job in high school um, before I went to college um, and in college I started singing for jazz ensemble and also began recording and writing my own original music um, I've been I have a a wide range of influences um, in the country space. I didn't really have that many uh, growing up, at least that I knew about. And um, so for me, I was really in inspired by the chicks because I feel like they just wrote songs that had a message and they made people angry. And I really liked that even when I was younger. Um, I was like, I want to do that. Um, and so kind of I, outside of country, I was really influenced by jazz, Ella Fitzgerald, uh, Roberta Flack, um, and then even modern artists like Corinne Bailey Ray and Leanne Le Havas have been huge influences for me. Um, and in discovering um, a lot of amazing other black country artists uh, like Reese Palmer, Brittany Spencer, those folks have become some of my biggest musical influences and inspirations as well. All right, RJ. Hey everyone again, I'm RJ, originally from Chicago here in Nashville. Um, with me, I just fell in love with music due to my dad being a choir director and a musician and my mom, it runs in the family. And so I said, you know, I wanted to be the first to actually do more than just singing in church. And so I started writing my own music and, you know, I love God and I love church and I love gospel music, but I said, you know, I wanted to give inspirational music. I live my life to tell the story about God without having to say I'm a Christian. So I said, you know, I wanted to deliver that message through music and through just my lifestyle. So I'm grateful to be here. Thank you, Keith and the staff. Great. Great. Thank you. That's rap. Yeah, so that's rap. Um, hip hop artist, spoken word artist and just being able to share my gift and my talents with people to leave them encouraged, inspired, motivated. Um, I've had the honor to be able to tour internationally in Japan, in Rwanda, in Uganda, um, in Canada, and just all over the US and just be able to, to leave people with that spark, um, as well as partnering with a lot of businesses, whether on the spoken word, front or the hip hop side is like Birchbox, uh, Chevrolet, NPR, um, TikTok, just to name a couple. And so, um, yeah, just, I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to, I'm honored to be on a panel of such amazing, incredible people. And so thank y'all for having me. Great, thank you. 
Thank you, everyone. Um, you have already, each of you has already inspired me. And so let's uh, get into this panel discussion. And all of you, of course, know that February is Black History Month. So we want to start our conversation uh, talking about some history that relates to us. Uh, the, this is a two-part question, but I'll ask the first part, we'll go around, answer, and then we'll move on to the second one. The question is, where does Black music begin for each of you and how has it evolved over the last century? So we'll go with you, Byron. All right, I'm, I'm raring to go. Um, I, I, I love this question um, because, you know, it starts one in Africa um, and then in even in the American experience um, when coupled with the different uh, oppressive and adverse experience many Africans face coming to America, that's kind of where Black music starts historically. For me, uh, as an individual, it, it starts in the heart of, uh, of the church. Um, hearing, hearing the hymns of old, hearing um, my mom and dad, um, and, and seeing those connections between uh, what we do now and what began then. And there's so many similarities. Um, even just amazing uh, idioms that kind of flow from what our ancestors did many, many years ago. Wonderful, Julie. Yeah, so for me, I, I immediately think of the country music space, uh, a genre that was created and pioneered by black artists, but many folks do not even know that, that yeah. the banjo was a slave instrument and mm -hmm. it was appropriated and through minstrel shows and and throughout history throughout time the history of of blackness in country music has been erased uh and that was even something that i had no idea until i moved to nashville and started to study more of the history of country music because it was something that black artists were encouraged and pushed out of and not seen as a, a space to for them to reclaim um uh, and so kind of outside of that, personally for me, um, I, I think black music begins for me with, with jazz. Uh, my family is from Louisiana. So New Orleans jazz is, is in our blood. Uh, my uh, great, um, my grandma, uh, my grandma's sister, uh, we had a conversation recently, she lives in Nashville of how uh, we're actually related to the Boldens she's a Bolden. Um, and so learning about Buddy Bolden and New York jazz, uh, or New Orleans jazz has been something that has been just it feels like returning home listening to that music. So jazz and, and as well, we always listen to a lot of Motown growing up. Um, so for me, that's kind of what I think of for myself, uh, where black music and loving and celebrating black music began for me. Oh, all right. RJ. Okay, so for me, definitely in the church, um, look, that's all I knew growing up. My dad, again, was the choir director, musician, so he didn't let us listen to anything other than gospel music, so that's all I knew. And so um, I'm grateful for that. Um, as, as far as like where it's going today, you know, it's, it's a little sad. We don't see many choirs coming together. We don't see many um, concerts anymore due to this crazy world and the pandemic and things that's taken place. Um, so I'm looking forward to bringing those things back into um, the world and back into music. Great, that's a, that's a wrap. Yeah, so um, of course with hip hop, you know, you have the, the source of the origin coming from New York, um, definitely stemming from like the DJ culture, the break dancing culture and the B-boy culture. Um, and then you have like ciphers where people would just kind of come together. Um, a lot of the, the rhetoric coming from the early stages of the hip hop was based out of um, self-expression and camaraderie, especially in, in spaces of poverty and, and violence and um, 
all different forms of oppression and just like um, his and so amazing about it is that not only do you have this element of liberation, but you also have this tremendous influence in which hip hop is arguably the most influential genre in the world right now in so many different capacities. So to see that development is just absolutely incredible. And then from the other side, you have spoken word, which spoken word is performance poetry. And poetry has been around, you know, <laughs> way, way, way back. Um, but being able to understand what that means for me, especially being a hip hop artist in Nashville, is being able to seamlessly be able to move between hip hop and spoken word, which primarily is just me performing my music a cappella with no music. Um, but it allowed me to move in non traditional spaces, especially spaces that may have a bit more of a bias towards hip hop and rap because of stereotypes and what people assume are the images and what the music and the messaging will be, but being able to kind of shift that perspective, shift that narrative and to show people that um, it be more and very transformative, so. That's wonderful. Um, as an African and also as a music educator, I have come to accept this truth that every people, I'm talking about people all around the world have their own music. But we also find that there are times when some cultures may think that their music is better than others or may even refuse to accept music of, the other, uh, of other cultures. So the follow-up question is this, is the influence of black music different in mainstream music today than it was 50 years ago? And if so, what has changed? Um, I I think yes. It, I think it's, it's there's been some uh, drastic uh, changes. Um, Fifty years ago, we see the emergence um, of of African American music, Black music, going into um, intersecting into the mainstream in such a way that it's reaching your TV stations more. Um, you're seeing it promote it more. I mean, you're, you're thinking about the latter 60s, 70s, you're talking about your Aretha Franklin's, you're talking about your Motown, you're talking about um, all of these great black artists um, where it was unpopular for many people to acknowledge publicly, but now um, they can be known, you know, uh, in, in, in the spaces that they're in. Um, I think also um, we've seen how that sound has been taken um, and reused um, to be something new. Um, a lot of the trends that we're seeing now are things that were very uh, reflective of what was done previously. Um, and um, we've seen how it's been market, marginalized and marketed to uh, different audiences. So yes, uh, it's changed a lot. Uh, it's changed a lot. It's, it's, it's become its own culture and its own sound. Great. For me, I, 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 I'm thinking of things through the country lens, of course, and I mean, a huge thing was one, I need to apologize in advance for you probably saw the dog around over my shoulder. I've got two dogs around and they will most likely make some sort of noise as I'm speaking. So first off, just they just love that. music. So that's fine. I know, I know. Especially if I were to start singing, one of them would start howling and singing along. They're wow. they're musical pups. Um, anyway, um, uh, I think in the past, I mean, really in the past few years, there's been so much more acknowledgement of the influence of black music um, on of of black music on country music. That that country music is black music. Um, and I think that was something that a lot of uh, folks in Nashville were were uh, were were forced to reckon with uh, in the past year or so, even of of acknowledging there were many people in the in music industry that had to acknowledge that they were not doing enough for Black artists and for Black music and country music. And um, so I, I do think that there is there has been. Um, 
increased acknowledgement of the influence of black music in country, uh, of um, black artists in country music. I th think of Linda Martell, um, the the namesake of Reese Palmer's uh, Apple Music radio station, Color Me Country, um, who is, was so influential and an incredible artist that never was able to to be known and and to be celebrated and and to be seen as as that namesake country person that you think of as you think of Johnny Cash, Hank Williams, all those people. Um, so I am excited that in the last year there's been much more of a um, celebration and um, of of black uh, artists, especially black female uh, country artists. Um, but at the same time, while there's that acknowledgement, um, you might see it on Spotify and other those spaces, the black music, there, there still is um, a lack of country music artists being played on country music radio, which is still a primary way that a lot of folks consume country music. And it's through, um, I, I believe it's like less than 1% of music played on country music radio. Uh, is of black artists, at least of, of black women. Um, and so while it's changed in some ways, there's also so many hurdles that black artists have to go through to get their, their music out and shared in the world even today. So to answer that question, um, yeah, definitely, it's definitely been a change. Um, it's when I think just back of how hard things was for, you know, the generation before us when it comes to putting out music, releasing it, getting that support, understanding that they didn't get as much support. And now, you know, I'm thinking about my time with social media. Um, we have that avenue to really share and to be free and to be us, but still there is a lack of support, especially in the industry. You know, being a black um, gospel artist or Christian artist with a sound that can be, um, as they consider CCM, it's so hard <laughs> to get played on um, those radio stations, understanding that even though we may have the sound, we don't look like them. So to this day, it's still a struggle. Um, but honestly, again, I'm grateful for the opportunity to have social media to express and to put my music out. I'm just speaking for me, regardless of what they say I should have to look like or I should have to sound like. Again, you know, God created us all and we all have our own sound, regardless on if it's CCM, if it's gospel, we're all one. And so I feel like now we are um, all realizing that, that we are all the same. I'm just wishing and praying that it will be more accepting as we move forward. Um, especially in the gospel industry, CCM side. So, yeah. Right. That's right. I think historically, and one thing I note, like, I think, like, spanning across the majority of genres is that um, there's this element that Black music tends to be expressive and it relates to whatever is going on during the times. And there was a strong silencing of Black voices, thoughts, and opinions, while at the same time, how can we take this and then turn it into um, a primary instrument in the vehicle of capitalism and oppression that our country has been built on, um, unfortunately. And when you look at a genre such as hip hop, where it is very, very dynamic and, and can be pretty, pretty extreme. But at the same time, in its early stages of inception, it was uh, a direct reflection of the environment and the times and the experiences of the people that were first creating. So it's a lot of hard language. It's a lot of sexuality. Um, it's a lot of violence and drugs and just mental issues and socioeconomic issues. And it's so polarizing because it felt like there's no way this is real. 
but in understanding that this is the reality of the creators. And then it wasn't until as it kind of turned into something where people are like, oh, I can actually monetize this. I can actually make this into popular music. And then realizing that as people started to identify with the fact that like, oh, you know what? Like I actually go through struggles too. Oh, you know what? I actually, I use this language as well. Oh, you know what? I may not be going through a mental health crisis, but someone in my family is or someone around me, or I have days where I'm living paycheck to paycheck or whatever your struggle may be. But once you start to be able to identify with the content, then it stops feeling like something that we should be alienating. And so um, I think as time has progressed, we're kind of moving away from this uh, appropriation, if you will. And now we're actually able to celebrate Black voices and not have to kind of um, dance around Black plight and Black struggle. And so I think that we still have a long way to go because there's still a bit of silencing that's happening or you have to fit the mold or you have to appeal to a certain type of market. But what we're learning, especially as of late with like your latest artists that are kind of popping up with Lil Nas X being able to um, wear his sexuality as a badge and actually have people come behind him. You have Lizzo that's popping up, you have Cardi B and Meg Thee Stallion, and you realize that it's about expression and letting people be able to express themselves. And even when we think that it's like, mm, there's a little, it's a little far, you know, um, again, it's reality. And we have to respect that, like, my, my reality isn't yours, but that doesn't mean that what you experience isn't real. And so giving people that space while also allowing them the opportunity that if revenue is to be generated off of that, it needs to go to the original creators and not the person who has the best marketing strategy. So. Okay. All right. Wonderful. Um, historically, Black artists, or I would actually say Black musicians have faced a lot of challenges. So my question to you is what challenges have black artists faced in the past and how are things different today if they are? Then the other question, the following question is what are some of the challenges that still exist today? If you need me to repeat these questions as you answer, just let me know. But what challenges have black artists faced in the past and how are things different today? All right. Um, I, I this is a really good question. Um, one is that black artists for many years in the past have been marginalized. Um, we look in prior to 1950, um, many songs were labeled as race music. Uh, and I mean, that's with Mahalia Jackson sitting next uh, to Bessie Smith. They were all in the same category. I mean, can you imagine somebody singing the blues and somebody singing a hymn standing next to each other um, and they're categorizing these songs and their success off of each other? Um, many times these people wouldn't even have the same audiences. Um, and it, it was not until the 1950s when they started using titles like rhythm and blues um, and even um, rock and roll, which we're also the trendsetters for as well. Um, it, it's it's being marginalized, put into one place. Um, it later moves on um, and, and even into the latter 60s and 70s where many uh, African Americans, could, Americans couldn't even perform in certain spaces. Um, they used to have to fight tooth and nail to get on an American bandstand or even get on certain stages. Or even, even to this modern day, I had a conversation with John Faddis, uh, the protege of Dizzy Gillespie, and he was saying that he was one of the uh, few African Americans who've been able to, re to perform uh, regularly at Carnegie Hall. Just those, those mentalities. Our music is the soundtrack of America. Um, and, and to be able for us at times to not even have the space uh, to, to even perform or be considered or for someone else to have to perform our music in order for it to be successful. For example, Big Mama Thornton wrote, you ain't nothing but a hound dog. Um, but even though she had commercial success, Elvis ran off of it. She never saw most of the money ever. Um, 
and he ran off with it and made it a hit. She never received all of the money that she was due for that song. Um, even when the state, the family, even Elvis himself tried to repay her, it was it was by then it was too late. Um, I think these are the things that we kind of have to when we look back historically. Um, our sound has always been something that people have wanted, um, but they love to use it when they can put it in their context. Um, matter of fact, Little Richard had a statement. He said they have Pat Boone on the record player, but they have my song under the under the mattress. And, and, and I, I think it's something everybody loves um, as a gospel artist. I can't tell you tell you how many times I get the call to be the choir. <laughs> I, 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 I think Dr. Kwame I know, what I'm about. I know, I know. To get know. to be the choir, um, but then you ask us to sing our song. Oh well, maybe we'll call you on in Black History Month. Are you serious? You need our sound, but you don't want to use it in its right context. Or they love for you to come and sing and have never bought a record. Um, I think those are the things that we've struggled with in the past. They've loved to put us on TV shows, award shows, events. Um, but then not to love us as an artist. Um, today, how that's reflected, um, many of the people, and I can say from the gospel standpoint, even in the classical world, in both, um, many of our songs um, are being sung in CCM. We've ghostwritten them. Um, somebody heard this song and they wrote their own version of it. They've simplified it. Um, I can't tell you, uh, and you know, and I love, you know, these individuals that are releasing the song. When I saw, heard Revelations 19, all oh, praises be, when I heard it on a CCM album and people said, oh, this is a new great song. I'm like, that song is 30 years old, <laughs> written by a Black artist. And I was like, and we've taken it and used it in certain lanes to make it. So what happens is you have a lot of gospel artists who are not making the amount of money um, as their white counterparts. But their music and their style and their arrangement is being used everywhere. I mean, tell me who doesn't copy off Aretha Franklin. I mean, I mean, we, the list goes on. Tell me who doesn't copy off of Marvin Gaye and Luther Van Drums. Tell me who doesn't. Um, and, and, and to see it now, um, we're still marginalized. Gospel music is one of the least bought uh, um, genres of music in music culture period in the industry. Um, they still have differences in the type of gospel that you do. Um, we're still the affirmative action call. So <laughs> just to black it up, so we'll, we'll call this one guy in and we'll let him sit there and smile. We're still that. Um, instead of our music being good. And that's why we get the phone call. So that's just some of the challenges. I could preach on a soapbox for hours, yeah. but I don't have time. <laughs> okay, good. I think, um, I mean, I, I want to echo everything that you just said in that. That was, I think, an amazing, just a summary of, of all of those things that that Black artists have faced and, and still face to this day, you know, maybe not in the exact same forms. I think of um, when I think of the challenges that Black artists faced in the past, violence, I mean, literal violence of um, in the spaces that they played, uh, not being able to play in the spaces they play, not being able to go tour bus being attacked, all of those things, right? Like physical violence, uh, the oppression of stories that aren't wanting to be, they don't want out or to be told. While at the same time, as you're saying, stealing the sound, like the innovation by Black artists driving changes in the rest of music, but Black artists not getting that credit, not being the ones that, while they drove that change, I mean, I think of an example of the influence of, of hip hop and pop in country music. Um, you know, th there's numerous, numerous white artists that are using lots of elements, lots of have, have a huge hip hop and rap influence in country music and are making a lot of money off of that. But then as soon as a black artist does that same thing and they're like, oh, that's that's not country, that's black music. And so that's, you know, that that uh, that oppression and that stealing of <clears throat> of innovation without 
proper credit is something that still exists to this day. Uh, but even the violence still exists to this day in it might not be in the same form as before, but I think an uh, example uh, is country artist Mickey Guyton. The, and she she posts about it a lot. If, if, um, if you all don't follow her on social media, you should, because she um, she receives a lot of, of hate of people telling her that she does not exist in this genre, that she should not exist in the world. And how do you, can you know, if, if this is something that artists are, are facing in this genre, how do you convince people that they should be a part of it? If, if they could never possibly feel comfortable sharing their stories, feel safe to, to tour. I, I know myself, I think of there's some, when I'm looking at like, oh, maybe I would wanna play this festival or things like that. That's the first thing that comes to my mind is would I be safe at this festival? Would, would someone like me be safe at, at that? And I think that that is a challenge that that black artists across genres and especially in country music have to have to unfortunately faced even today. Listen, I legit feel like Byron answered this question for all of us, um, especially because I was going to talk about just stages like where we perform. Um, I know back then, definitely it was tough. They couldn't, you know, again, violence, all of that was taking place. They, it was scary for them to perform certain songs and do certain things in certain areas. And even to this day, you know, I think about stages and how, you know, being black can limit us from being on certain stages and getting certain calls. You know, we can get calls to do the background vocals and to do everything else. But when it comes to supporting us as an artist and doing our, you know, individual work, they're nowhere to be found. And so, you know, it's kind of disheartening because again, we're just simple people trying to still tell our story and tell our version of, you know, what we believe. And so, you know, I just, when I think about um, just certain stages, again, for me, just thinking about how, you know, I will get calls to do CCM songs written by, you know, other artists. That's what they love to hear and want to hear, but they don't want to hear from RJ. So, you know, it's, it's, it's disheartening. And I'm praying and hoping that things will get better as we progress and as we really show them that we are individuals. We do have our own sound and we do have a way of introducing, you know, music to this world. And it will change the world if they allow us to be us and use our voices, so. Yeah, and I think with um, with hip hop, there's that element that a lot of the challenges happen before we even have a conversation or enter the room. Um, there's a lot of venues here in Nashville and it's slowly changing. Um, I'm not gonna say no names. Basically, it's this idea that they won't allow hip hop shows or rap shows without a completely different restructuring of how the show is paid for, how um, the venue is insured, because they believe this idea and these stereotypes that, oh, rap fans are violent. So if we do a rap show, things will get destroyed. People will end up fighting or, you know, having shootings and stuff like that. But if you have, you know, like a metal show when people are running around and having like mosh pits and swinging hip-hop or rap scene, um, subtle hints of like microaggressions and discrimination with the rules that are in place in green rooms, where it'd be like, hey, you can't use this substance that's primarily associated with hip-hop, but there's kind of a gray area where if there are any other substances that you might use, these are okay. And it's like, well, why is that? Is that connected to a specific genre? Is that something that people see and understand that they're implementing in a way that is targeting and marginalizing um, a certain group of people. And so with that, it's like, it's interesting because even as we look at time and how it has, um, if we look at the concept of censorship in time and how things have progressed before when I was a child, like you watch TV and there's no profanity at all. You watch a movie that's PG-13, there's no profanity. And now you're slowly seeing censorship be lifted. And what happens is people will try to, okay, 
you're a rap artist, no, you can't come perform here. You can't do this or you can't say that. But if I'm a superstar, if I'm Drake, I can come perform and talk to your kindergarten class or your third grade class, or I can come talk to your business and be unapologetically myself. But there's kind of this gap where I have to get to a certain point to where my notoriety um, will pay off for the potential risk that you're facing with that. And it's it's disheartening because at the end of the day, like especially if you go to Naaman, you'll see that artists that we celebrate, it's because they were unapologetically themselves. You would not be a fan of Prince if Prince was not Prince. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, when you look at hip hop artists, it's like, they're a little rough around the edges sometimes and not all of them are, but you do have to accept them for who they are. And then it makes it hard because if you have an artist that is from a different vibe, such as myself, where it's like, I'm very, very, um, conscious a lot of conscious rhetoric um i'm very like pro-black if you will like i love black people i love black love and just being able to advocate for the issues that we face in society um and sometimes people can get a bit standoffish but then when they hear me they're like oh wow this is great i'm not black but like i i now want to support i now you know want to listen i now want to interact with people and i want to hear and understand how i can change to better make this a space that's conducive for everybody but if you don't have those conversations in that interaction if you don't let people in the room and give them the opportunity you never get that first step and element of change so wow this is and all if, amazing yeah if i can just add one thing i think yes. you know we look at our ancestors like billy holiday who struggled if, we, if you ever haven't seen the phone uh, films any of the films you should check them out but like we look at our ancestors like billy holiday with strange fruit unable to give certain messages even it still happens in a quieter way i mean the things um you should read up about how dr dre in this past super bowl was censored in some areas um that well you can't say that line about the police or you can't say this and you can't say that and you and and they would never have done that had that been um, any other artist. If that was Garth Brooks, they, Brooks, they would have never said that. Um, but they censored him on, on many areas, even though he kind of broke the mold. We are still dealing with being able to tell our story in a truthful manner. I agree. And we could actually talk about these topics for hours. Um, but let's move on to another question. This is a very interesting question. Uh, I'd like every one of you to share an assumption or myth about black music that you would like to dispel or respond to. So we'll start with you, Byron. Oh, okay, awesome. Um... I know for me, um, I am the co-founder of the Inversion Vocal Ensemble. Uh, I remember one of the reasons we had started, um, I was asked to come and sing somewhere and um, they wanted a, a, the choir I was singing with at the time, they wanted us, I won't name them, uh, they wanted us to come and sing this song. Got up, we sang it, most of us were classically trained. Uh, and the director slash stage manager and the producer walk out and it was like, no guys, we need you to really sing. Give us that black church. Mm. <laughs> we, uh, and, and, I'm, and we were all looking like, what is that? You know, um, cause we were all trained. We can do now when we sold me and a couple of friends got together and we said, no, we're going to start our own thing. And we're gonna sing it all. We're gonna go from handle all the way, uh, uh, all the way to Erica <laughs> Whatever, whatever you want, we want to prove that we can sing it all. And um, the the myth is that black music is monolithic. That people think that we can only do one thing. Uh, we are one trick pony. You know, we loud and we can scream and holler. 
Um, there are many talented artists that can do more than just make a lot of loud noises. Uh, we can actually be musical. Um, yes, so that would be my myth. <laughs> I could give you a lecture on that. It's true, so true. Julie. Yeah, I think one of the myths, um, kind of going off of a point that you made earlier, Byron, of um, in the past of putting all these different artists um, with incredibly different sound under race music. And I feel like for um, black country artists, there's kind of this, that same sort of thing. They're like, oh, I want to get, you know, a black artist on this show or on this roster without acknowledging that, you know, myself, Britney Spencer, Raina Roberts, Willie Jones, like we're all different and we all have different um, influences and goals with our country music, but they're all kind of put under a black country music. Uh, I think that that's, that that's kind of a, a myth that at least in the country music world, that it's like, okay, there's all country artists and then this is all black artists and they're all gonna be sounding the same, doing the same thing. And I think, I, I, I think that all of that is a huge myth that um, I was, I remember talking with a, a industry friend of mine because uh, about, um, they were trying they were talking about which manager would be best for this one artist and they're like oh well this this artist already works with this other black artist so that then that's fine um and they said and this person was like no well they're completely different artists they have they're going to need a completely different management strategy they have different audiences and all of that the only thing that's tying them together mm -hmm. is that they're both black and and so that kind of is this i think a big a horrible myth that's that's going on at least in the country music industry that doesn't see the i, I mean the, the variety and the complexity and the the beautiful yeah variety of country music artists that we have that that also are are black as well um yeah so from um, my standpoint so I'm a very soft-spoken person, and I also I'm a soft-spoken singer at times. So the myth um, I believe is that you know we're trying to be like them, and I I hate this. I hate that so much. You know, I can't help that I'm not. You know, gospel is in my background. You know, I'm used to singing in a choir, but I don't I don't feel like I have a choir voice. <laughs> That's just my opinion. I'm a soft-spoken singer, so me and my guitar or me and the piano, you know, that's it for me. I'll be okay. I can make it through. Um, I'm just, I'm, I, I'm, I'm so sick of hearing that we're trying to be like them. We're trying to appear to be something that we're not. And I totally disagree with that. At the end of the day, I am my own individual. I do have my influences, but believe it or not, my influences are Erica Badu or Kim Burrell or Jonathan McReynolds. You get what I'm saying? So it's like, you know, I wish they will stop acting like they created what we're doing. I'm just saying. I think for me, I'd say that um, the myth is that hip hop is the bottom of the barrel. It's like the scum, the gunk at the bottom of the barrel of music. And um, it's very infuriating because there is one artist who is a massive artist now, um, Post Malone, who he got his start in hip hop, but then after he kind of blew up, he then started going back, quote unquote, to his roots, which is like more folk music, and different stuff and he was in an interview and he said that um if you want to to hear music that tells stories don't listen to rap like there's nothing in rap listen to folk music because that's where the stories are and um i've worked with a youth teaching writing creative writing spoken word songwriting with the youth all over middle tennessee and what I've learned, even from a technical standpoint, is that rap is one of the most versatile genres that exists. And whether you want to break it down in OT rhythm, teach cadence, if you want to talk about the interesting ways that people um, pursue melodies, 
because it's very non-traditional and it can kind of go against the grain of the status quo of what you may be taught in a traditional setting. Um, or maybe just even understanding that like, if you talk to like a, a person that masters in linguistics, they'll explain how language, rap is the next level of evolution in terms of language and how we speak and just how speech changes. And there's so much embedded in just the mechanics before you even get to the stories and how stories are told and how descriptive they can be. And I think that a lot of people essentially sleep on the genre and sleep on the people that created. And then from there, kind of have this fear that like, if you listen to rap, you're going to be less intelligent or you might end up having a natural inclination towards violence or towards drugs or to these negative um, stigmas that are associated. But it's not necessarily the case. And if you actually take it for what it is at face value, it's gold the like everything that's created you can find something that is a nugget of gold whether you're looking at people that you hate to listen to they got something and there's a reason why people listen to cardi there's a reason why people listen to chris brown there's a reason why people listen to these artists and it's not um it's something that they don't like it when it's from a black artist but if someone else pops up and does it that's not black or a person of color, all of a sudden it's the greatest new trend, the greatest new thing. And I think um, giving that credit where credit is due and not allowing things to be whitewashed is very, very, very important for us to move toward a better and more inclusive future. Great, thank you all. Uh, we'll move on to the next question. Um, everyone knows that we live in a city that is filled with a variety, a large variety of music. So how has black music been affected by the changes here in Music City over the last five years? And I'd like you to share some hopes and concerns about where Nashville is headed as it relates to black music. Um, well, first, I want to celebrate the legacy of the Fish Jubilee Singers. Uh, one, um, for being a mainstay and one of the bedrocks of Black music, period. Um, and then even the work in the last uh, 20, uh, 30, almost 30 years that you've done, Dr. Kwame, to help um, keep that thing going and also re and how you've reinvented the singers in such a way that they are relevant for both the generations of the past and, and the present. Um, because of that, it's spun off so many other careers. Mm. Um, I mean, we, we look at three of the uh, people that may not even necessarily been a Jubilee singer, but were just a part of the Fist legacy. Uh, Kyla Jade, who was on The Voice, came up to number three. Christina Fentress, uh, uh, America's Got Talent, number three. You know, um, Eric Copeland, voice, former yeah. Jubilee singer. Mandisa, si <laughs> former Jubilee singer. Um, and, and, and that's one institution that has kind of helped um, push uh, Black music al uh, along, especially in the main current of our city. Um, a lot of people don't realize that the Fairfield Four are from Nashville, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. um, Additionally, uh, I work at, obviously, name ma'am, a lot of people don't know Dr. Bobby Jones is from Nashville, Tennessee, and the Nashville Super Choir, I don't know how you missed it, they said Nashville Super Choir, but that's okay. Uh, <laughs> um, longest running gospel music show ever, and was one of the longest running shows on TV, uh, on cable TV, period. He beat out CNN. And so I, I, I think it's been here. I think there's always been powers that be that always wanted to kind of hide it. Um, also, there are so many spaces that have opened up. There's so many things that are going on. I think now we're in a space where we're learning to love our own sound. So we're willing to prom uh, promote our own sound. Um, uh, Nay, ma'am, if you haven't been, shameless plug, you should come and visit us. Uh, National Museum of African American Music. Um, We've been working on hosting many events, partnering with different people in our city uh, to promote 
uh, Black music. Uh, last month, we had an event with Slim and Huskies, and uh, we we had many new and emerging artists come and share. Um, and you would be surprised how many African Americans uh, actually uh, represented and how the community came in and filled the place up um, and, and supported. You know, we're seeing thousands of people come in every week uh, and, and just surprised that they that we have something here. Mm -hmm. So how has it evolved? Um, it's developing a presence. Uh, watch out country, you know, <laughs> uh, Music Hall of Fame, because we even have some country artists that are emerging in the city that are taking over. So, you know, black music, uh, whether it's gospel, country, rap, blues, jazz is uh, having its own platform. You're hearing even on Broadway, you're starting to hear R&B. Like, you're like, you know, Michael Jackson is well represented in some of these uh, bars now. It's, it's amazing, the shift that is taking place in Nashville. Um, so it, it's, it's really moving forward. I'm amazed to see what's going to happen in another five years. Okay. Oh, yeah, I will, I will bounce off that point of watch out country music uh, because there are some incredible, incredible artists, uh, Black artists that are coming out of Nashville. I mean, I can only, I've only been here two and a half years, so I can't, I can't speak on the whole last five years and the time before, but I feel like even in this past two and a half years, I mean, it's been two and a half years, but time does not, I, time has not moved in the same way in these past few years with everything going on. So I feel like I've seen a lot of changes as well. I mean, a huge, there was a, a humongous focus, uh, or a kind of magnifying glass that was put on the music industry uh, in the wake of George Floyd's mur murder and the march um, in Nashville and uh, uh, all the black in Instagram squares from the music industry. Um, there was this kind of huge focus and of this, where are, where are these black country artists? You know, I mean, I even moved to Nashville and I was, that was a huge struggle of mine when I moved here is everyone tells you to go and play these writers rounds at these bars on Demumbrian and all of those, like, that's how you do it. And I was just going there and just finding a lot, a lot of white people that I was playing with a lot in the audience. And it, it took kind of this past year or so that all of a sudden I was learning about and discovering amazing black country artists. and. So one of my hopes, I guess, that's come about in these changes is we've started to find each other and we have this incredible community that's growing. We have this this group chat, this Instagram group chat of all the black women in country music. Reese Palmer is doing this incredible work of bringing together the Color Me Country class, of bringing all of us, all of us together and so we can write with each other and work with each other and learn with each other and continue to pull and uplift. I think you see Mickey Guyton and Brittany Spencer and Reese Palmer, they're doing in, incredible work to open doors, but also bring people along with it. So the hope that I have is with the artists that we have now and the community that's coming together um, over this past year. I mean, some of the concerns that I still see, um, the question of is, is this just a wave? Is this just something that the music industry is caring about right now? And they're just going to, a year is going to pass and they're not going to care at all. Um, and I think a huge part of that, uh, and I think while there's being changes that can be reflected on the artist level that we're seeing more black artists um, in the country music space, the black artists are just the top of an entire music industry. Are there black managers? Are there black publicists? There are so many um, different layers at which black folks, not only in the music side, the artistic side, but also in the industry side are being shut out. Um, and so that is something that I think less of the f attention or limelight or focus has been on, but how are we gonna support black artists in country or in other genres if there are not folks 
that are in the, those rooms that are, you know, in the, making those marketing decisions, all of those that are black folks or people of color. So that's definitely um, a concern that I see. One other concern about Nashville is I, I feel like people don't understand that when, when you say you're gonna support black artists and put them on your stage, they're gonna tell black stories. And sometimes those stories might not be the stories that some, some of it's uncomfortable truths. I, I remember I have this song of mine that's called Southern Curls. Um, and I remember performing it at, um, it's about uh, kind of my hair as a, just a, 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 talking about my hair, but also just talking about my experience growing up. And I remember performing it at like a, a, a pitch to publishers kind of night where you would, you would perform your songs and people would critique it. And every single person on that panel, all white, were like, I really love the song, but I just don't get why you talk so much about hair like could it be uh you know i feel like that that like sometimes i just don't get it i just don't get that part or like can you change it away from that to make it more applicable to everybody like to everybody because the, the um the message of the song it's it's not all southern girls are, are met with open doors some of us are looked down on before we're even born um and someone's like, I really like that message of people being outsiders, but could you take away the hair parts so other people who are outsiders feel involved? And I'm like, that's, this is not who this, this song is for. If, and as soon as you play it for somebody else who has lived that experience, they're like, this, I lived this and now I can hear this. And that's, that's the type of music that I want to do. And so uh, songs that I wish that I had heard, uh, stories that I, I wanted to hear the stories that I lived. And I feel like that's something that's still, while people are like, we want to support black artists. They're like, uh, but why, you know, why do you have to focus on, on these things that are inherently black? And I think that's um, been something that a lot of black artists, myself, Vicki Guyton as well, with music that she's putting out now have had to face that backlash uh, from on the industry side. Okay, RJ. Yeah, so I actually want to give a huge shout out to Byron, um, who actually took a chance out on me. So I, I'm i new to artistry. I've started like, well, not, I guess, five years. I guess that's a, it's a, a time, but I actually made a Facebook post on Facebook and was looking for an artist. And he posted his music and we got connected. And since he's been a part of my musical journey, so I'm so appreciative of him because when I first moved here, um, you know, again, music has always been a part of me, but I would love watching, I can't think of the name of the channel, but they will play all the country music, um, music videos. And I would just watch, watch, watch. I knew every song. <laughs> I, and I didn't, I barely saw any black artists on there. And so you know, nowadays, you know, that I watch music videos and I go look, I see us really striving in music videos and really doing it up. And so, again, I'm just appreciative of Byron. He opened me up to the community and gospel music too, um, being a newer artist and being different from um, most gospel artists. And so it really helped me to, you know, see the rope and see and put me in arenas and areas where I'm just like, oh, wow, we actually exist in Nashville um, because you know you will go downtown and you'll look and peek into the bars and see none of us and so now I'm definitely seeing the transition like when I do I'm not a bar person but when I do go downtown areas you know I do hear um, familiar voices and I see us striving and I see us making you know premieres on shows like The Voice and all of that so it's definitely changing and I'm, I'm, I'm appreciative of the change. Right. right. Yeah, I say that um, I'll never forget right after I graduated college in 2013, there was a period where I was kind of traditional uh, of like library. So let me go to co-writing sessions and I went to um, 
different places just to meet writers and be like, hey, I'm a hip hop guy, but I can write for other genres. And I came across this guy that was in the music industry and he just flat out told me, I was looking for advice and he was like, um, if you wanna make it in the hip hop industry, you need to move. Hmm. You gotta go either Atlanta, New York or LA. Those are your only options. There's nothing here for you in Nashville. And lo and behold, within the past five years, you now are seeing this migration of the music industry to Nashville and not just country music anymore, but you have like all these label execs, publishing houses, everybody, they're kind of like Nashville is the spot. And so it's great because when you look at spaces like Broadway, um, with the exception of Acme and now events that happen in Name Man, it's like, you're not seeing urban music there at all. Like, um, and if you are, it's some secret select private event upstairs in the back. It's not on the ground where people can walk by and pop in. And so what's beautiful is that representation is really changing things. And as you're seeing hip hop be in spaces and exist in ways that it's non-traditional, but like nine times out of 10, the music that you hear on a commercial, it's hip hop. Background music that you hear in a space, it's hip hop. Popular trending songs on social media, it's hip hop. And so now you understand that that's actually what people want to hear. Nashville is a huge tourist place. And you have all these, um, what do you call them? Like you got the pedal taverns, then you got the party buses and party tractors. And guess what they're listening to? hip hop, right? So it's beautiful because now you're starting to see the thirst boil up to the surface. So now Acme has like these rooftop shows that they do and they even have, they've been having a lot more urban artists perform there. Namem has these incredible concerts and you're able to like see people rally. And what's beautiful is that you have this camaraderie. Like, so in the same way that Julie was saying how there's like this, this very strong connection and support within country. You have that within hip hop as well. So it's like, it's a small circle, very, very small, but we all know each other and it's all love and support, which is very beautiful. And then you have other organizations like Nashville is not just country music. Um, um, there's so many, uh, no new country Nash or something like that. And it's like, but all these places are like, where can we go to get the support? Um, in September of last year, I dropped a spoken word album with my friend uh, Rashad the Poet. And it's a spoken word slash a hip hop album, but immediately the community in Nashville just like soaked it up. We were doing radio interviews, WNXRP. We were on uh, Soul of the City Nashville. We were on NPR, just all Nashville scene, um, all these different spaces. And it's because we're all collectively getting to a point to where it's like, we need to keep um, the music with the original creators and elevate that person to show that love, to support that person and not let it get stripped away. And that is a huge, huge key to make sure that we can preserve um, this lifestyle to be able to provide these artists with a healthy lifestyle so they can be sustainable while also driving it forward as well, so. That's amazing. Um, I'm really enjoying everything that you're all saying. And personally, I believe following the story of the original Fisk Jubilee Singers that so we, we just need to know who we are. And we also need to know what we have because the original Fisk Jubilee Singers at one point were in a situation where they were asked to sing their director had trained them to sing Western classical music. They started singing it and people just showed a lot of disrespect. And they said, if these people will not listen to us when we sing, then let us sing our own songs to ourselves. They started singing the song, Steal Away to Jesus, and that changed everything. So that leads me to this question for you. How can our listeners best show support and welcome you as Black artists today? This is 
a personal question for each of you. Um, one, I will say this. Um, sometimes we are the biggest uh, critics of our own sound. Um, I, 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 will, I will say that. Um, I remember growing up um, studying music and um, I would have music teachers who would tell me that the sound that was coming from me and my people was wrong. <laughs> That's not how you do it. You do it like this. Um, and what that trained us to do was to hate the sound that came out of our history and our heritage. And which, which there's always a good way to do everything, but then there is this thing where we put disdain on things and we don't realize that that's actually a microaggression that we've been taught. Um, but how can we, how can we support it? One of the things is create spaces. Um, you may not have a whole lot of money, you may not have a whole lot of things, but create spaces, whether it's a house concert, whether if you're having an event, open up the door for Black music to come in, you know, uh, find, find ways, find out who's doing things in your city um, and, and put down investments, you know, share a, share a video, um, share a link. Um, there's several pages, we have Nashville Black Music, Nashville's got gospel. We have the Nashville's not just country. Find ways and find artists to support and push. When when you support and push these artists, it gives them um, the space um, to 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 do di different things. Also, recommend them when you hear that somebody is um, in need of something and looking for something. Br bring up the names of, of certain inv individuals that you know can deliver, you know, uh, and, and that helps popularize it. And then um, my most important thing, and I know RJ's heard me say this a thousand times, make sure you support other people. Um, we as artists have to support each other. Um, you know, I think one the a lot of times we sit on the couch waiting for someone to support us, but we never think to go support someone else. Um, and when you do that, it, it, it creates community. Um, and we're seeing more of it now, especially, I think the pandemic has taught us a lot, uh, how the couch can humble us all. Uh, <laughs> uh, whether you're 12 Grammys or no Grammys, it's it, it humbled us all. And so, yeah, just support and push and, and look up different artists that you've never heard before. Um, that's what Spotify is for. Uh, <laughs> so we we we're and also come and visit me, ma'am. I'm, I'm shameless club. They let me off today <laughs> for this. Um, I think uh, you know, echoing everything that you were saying before there. I think a huge thing is, especially in country music, where still so much of the country consumes country music through country music radio, uh, which there are a lot of of gatekeeping there that happens that people aren't discovering black artists they're not discovering women they're not discovering a lot of this music because radio stations have found that they can just make a lot of money playing a lot of the same things of from the same type of artist so i think a huge thing of that is when you is when you find that artist that you love and support share share them around say like i know you love country or I know you say you don't like country, but I really think you'd like this artist. A lot of that kind of sharing and things has to happen outside of those music industry ways for a lot of black country artists on Spotify and those things. So when you find those those artists that you really love and vibe with, share them around, listen to their things, buy their merchandise, buy tickets to their show if you if you can, all of those those ways to put money in those artists pockets that they might not be getting on the other side from the music industry. Cause I think all of us know it's pretty, pretty expensive and it's really, really tough. Um, and so, you know, cash is a great way to support if there's any way you can put, you know, money in those artists, in those artists bank to continue making the music that you love. Yeah. Um, I think, uh, you know, echoing as well, Byron's point of us supporting each other, a, a huge thing is, um not just for black artists but black musicians uh you know making sure that the session guitar you know our black bass player 
bass players being booked for those sessions to be the session bass player to all those it, it goes so down so much farther than just those top artists that you see that that face of some of a whole genre right like there's so many different artists and musicians and creatives photographers videographers i remember for myself when i did my music video i for that southern curl song i was like this is a black story it needs to be told by black creatives and i can't tell you how hard it was i was just reaching out to people I'm like hey do you know any black videographers and directors and people that knew so many people in the industry were like i have no idea and that was i mean there there are incredible creatives in this town of every sort of set of every type so how are you supporting not only black artists but black creatives because we all uplift each other we all inspire each other whatever medium we're working in um you know and, and so i feel like that's uh, on your point there is making sure that we're also uplifting each other outside of the music industry because we all we're all going to come up together so yeah Absolutely. So I agree with everything that's been said so far. Um, I think for um, just speaking for me, I think it really warms my heart when I receive messages or like the other day, one of my friends called me and was just like, you know, I was playing your song in the car and my, one of my friends was with me and he really wanted to meet you. He, you know, this song really touched his heart. Like he was on the airplane listening to it on repeat, crying to it. I'm just like, wow, like this is this is real. And so to receive that, it made me want to continue knowing that, man, just this one song touched somebody's heart. And so it's supporting, like they said, like reposting on Facebook, Instagram, whatever you got to do, you know, share to let someone else know, because I mean, obviously, if it blessed you, if it helped you through some tough and hard times, it can help someone else. And so, you know, I believe that with all genres, you know, I feel like music is a big part of just our generations every day. I mean, we wake up listening to music, we go to sleep listening to music, we work out listening to music. So just imagine if we can support each other in that area of just sharing and listening and creating Spotify playlists or Amazon playlists, adding the people that you may know. Like I'm making it my job today to make sure I follow everyone that's on here today and listening to their music and pushing and supporting them knowing that they're you know we're all trying to go somewhere you know we all have a bigger goal to touch more and more people with our music with our story and with our sound so if you want to support hey show it by sharing following like they said purchasing our music and just stand in tune with what we have coming up next great yeah and i was gonna say like rj hit a beautiful point is that being a creative, being a Black creative, um, especially in music, it's a very thankless job. And so even the social media comments, hey, I was listening to this song and it just touched me. It may feel like, oh, I'm just a comment in a sea full of people, but we see those and we receive those messages. Um, the tweets, the retweets, the reshares, we see all, and it's like, it may feel like, oh, well, we got it all together. But it's like, you know, we're human. We enjoy and need that encouragement as well. And so even from a fan perspective, if you have something that you connect with in our art, like, please let us know, because that is what keeps us going. That adds the fuel to the fire so that we can keep creating the stuff that you love. Um, the second thing I say is that if there is something that resonates with you, share it and share it with the people that are around you because people are more likely to engage with art when it comes as a personal recommendation versus just a blanket post that you see on social media. Um, and so, of course, when you connect and you're like, hey, this song made me think of you. Hey, I know you were having a down day. Check this out. Hey, I know you've been feeling insecure about your hair. Check out this song by Julie. All of a sudden, it's just like, yo, this is my this is my mantra right here. This is what gets me up in the morning. If you are a person that you do have the capacity to curate events, um, call on black artists and ask for recommendations. And for fellow artists, don't be afraid to talk about other people and your peers. One of the best pieces of advice that I got is that it's not a doggy dog world. 
there's more than enough room at the table for everybody to eat. And so by me bringing someone else's name that might be a better fit, that's not taking food out of my mouth. And if anything, I'm still going to get my blessings while someone else is getting theirs. And so the more that we can continue to share those experiences and just be like, hey, you know what? You asked me who were the top five artists in Nashville. I'm not going to be sitting there and be like, ah, how can I frame this list and make sure I'm number one? It's like, no, like this is my brothers. These are my sisters. Um, if you're in the, the space of hip hop, make sure that you highlight women. Um, make period. There's there's definitely not a um, a huge conversation around that. And there are so many amazing creatives that are popping up that definitely deserve their um, their flowers. And uh, yeah. And last but not least, just stay connected, you know, stay connected on social media, come to our shows, anything that the best piece of advice that I got was that you can say thank you to best with a check. <laughs> all right, <laughs> all right. So very buy, good buy very a good. ticket to the show yeah that's true yeah. very good okay uh we'll move to the final question and um i'm just going to limit each of you to two minutes for this one the final question is do you believe music plays a role in the overall health and well-being of artists and its listeners how so if that is true? And then as an artist yourselves, how does expression through creation contribute to your own personal health and well-being? All right. Um, as mm, music is the language of the soul to me. Um, any creative, any level of creativity is the language of the soul. Um, music. Um, to me can express what words cannot. Um, even if it's an O or a moan, it can say so much. Um, music is spiritual to me. Um, and 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 it can it can do things, it can change attitudes, uh, rooms. Um, music has started wars <laughs> and ended some at the same time. Um, so uh, it, it's, it's just so powerful and it can it can literally change. There are people who are struggling uh, mentally and emotionally. I'm always an advocate for mental health. And um, there are, are therapies that are music based. That, that music is so powerful. Um, in, in my experience, um, creating music um, has saved my life. I grew up in a very traumatic, bad childhood. Uh, I love to always share about it because I always had opportunities um, to get out that frustration and that angst um, and sing and perform, whether it was at church, whether it was on stage. Um, and I was able to release emotions that even at the time at, young, at a younger age, I wasn't, didn't have the language for. And um, it's, it's kept me. So um, music is, is, if it was a person, it would be my best bud. So. <laughs> right. I think... For me, music is storytelling and storytelling is healing. That's hmm. hearing yourself, what you've gone through. Sometimes the things that we go through in life can feel so isolating and you can feel so alone in what you're feeling. And to hear, I, I can think of times, specific times in my life when I was going through specific things and I can tell you exactly what album I had on repeat at that time, because that album or that person did something to, did something to me to help me make it through and i think that there's that there is an incredible gift in music of healing that you can heal not only others but also heal yourself i think having the there's a there's a, a way of, of processing things that that you do when you write a song oftentimes i find it's the greatest thing of i'm like i can never imagine continuing to think about this one memory, it's going to be too hard. And then getting into that song, and it might be difficult at that time. And uh, it can be healing to do it with other folks too, helping you bring that song to life. And then oftentimes you, as you perform and sing the song and see it connect with people in different ways, you get ownership over that story of that feeling. And it's something that I found is super healing um, as an artist of, of being like, wow, 
and looking back at your history of songs and being like, I made it through that time. And I can listen to that song and know that I made it through. And also that maybe that what I went through in that song is going to help someone else make it through that time that they're going through as well. So it's just such an honor to be able to be a part of the world of music and have the, the joy of creating it and um, being healed from it and and hopefully contributing to the healing of others as well. Great. Listen, we got some good people in here, but um, yeah, music is is definitely ministry to me, and I don't mm -hmm. care what genre it is, it's ministry because, again, we are telling our story, not knowing that there are people out in the world experiencing the same thing that we once been through. So our transparency is really saving other people, and and also ourselves. You know, um, many of the songs that I've written are from a time of when I was going through. Um, but my healing really took place once I started singing the songs and once I started seeing that it connected to other people, they could relate. You know, I, you know, had people that don't believe in God, um, you know, who are atheists, took a chance out to listen to songs that I've written as an inspirational Christian artist and was like, man, you know, I connected to this. I, you know, what's the story behind this? And this just opened up their eyes and the possibility of knowing that there is a God. Yeah. So it's like, man, just by me being transparent and being open with what I'm experiencing with my lyrics, help someone see and give them something to believe in. So, you know, I'm I'm just honored and, and blessed to be chosen to be a writer and an artist to share my story. And, you know, to all of you guys on here, um, as artists, you know, I commend you and I thank you for your transparency as well and doing what you're doing and just wanted to encourage you guys to continue doing it. I'm a fan and I'm already following you guys. So, yeah. Wonderful. Well, I love the perspective and the idea that there is a profound amount of research behind music and just the benefits. Um, live shows help you live longer. Uh, music used in tandem as um, sources for therapy have been able to help people um, mitigate like the impact of trauma and to be able to kind of like have stronger personal development. Um, music also is one of the few ways that penetrates like the Alzheimer's brain and is allow people to uh, recall memories when people have dementia. So based upon songs that are connected to specific memories in time and history, which is very beautiful. And then I think um, coming from a spoken word perspective, that spoken word typically floats around a lot of like socio-political, socio-economic issues. And a lot of people um, are a little bit apprehensive to really talk about the things that they feel and things that stand up to them, especially if they feel like, you know, I don't want to be the nail that's sticking out because the nail that sticks out the most is the first one to get hammered down. Mm -hmm. However, when you have artists that are able to express your thoughts, your ideas, your concerns, your beliefs, and then all of a sudden you can connect and resonate with that, it provides a sense of comfort, not just for the listener, but also for the artist as well. And then you can go and take that and now you have a tool, a device to start the conversation and to prime the engine of change. Wonderful. Wow. Um, honestly, we could go on talking about these topics for hours and hours, uh, but I know we are limited. So first of all, Byron Harvey, Julie Williams, RJ Green, and Sarap. Uh, I need to say this here. Sarap and my son, one of my sons, went to school together. So I've known him for many, many years. And it's amazing to see what you're doing. I've learned a lot from the four of you today. You've in, inspired me personally. Um, but I also want to encourage all of us. Yes, we know that as Black artists, as Black musicians, as people who produce and perform Black music, we have challenges. But when we believe in who we are and when we believe in the products that we have, and when we go out and in sincerity share our music and our talent with people, we will change the hearts of people. 
it becomes a way of educating people. So they come to understand us, they come to understand our culture, they come to understand why we do these things. So I want to thank all of you for taking time to be on this panel. I will look out for you and begin to listen to your music. And um, even if there's a, an opportunity for you to perform with the Face Jubilee Singers, we'll find a way to do that so we can educate the public. I see your hand, watch out. <laughs> uh, Keith, thank you very much for bringing us together. I've enjoyed this and I hope that our listeners have uh, enjoyed it as well. So I'll turn it over to you now. Thank you, uh, Professor Kwame. We do appreciate you for moderating today. Uh, on behalf of 54, I would like to thank each of our aspiring panelists for sharing these important experiences and wisdom reflecting the rich diversity in Black music and a very special thank you again to Dr. Paul T. Kwame for your wonderful moderation of this special event. To learn more about Dr. Kwame, listeners are encouraged to tune into our Squeeze Today podcast for our latest episode, where he is our special guest feature. Uh, you can also visit 54.org slash podcast or listen wherever you get your podcast. Dr. Kwame, we're so grateful for your time and and your talents, and we thank you, and we also thank our listeners. Uh, to learn more about the All of Us Research Program and how we uh, do inclusion of diversity, you can help improve the health for all of us. Please visit us at www.joinallofus.org slash 54, where you can learn how to become one in a million with us. And in closing, please enjoy this 30-second PSA about the program to take us out. Thank you again for being with us today. All across the country, people are coming together to speed up what we can learn about health. The All of Us Research Program is calling on one million people to join us as we try to change the future of health. For your family, for future generations, for all of us. Visit joinallofus.org and find out how you can become one in a million.